All right, it's time to talk about trading in the secondary market. So in this video, I'm going to start off talking about the regulation in the US that really governs how we operate as investors. It's called Reg FD. Then I'll start to talk about what broker dealers do. So you're probably more familiar with these as dealers. Then we'll talk about how you actually trade in the real world. And ultimately, should you day trade? Obviously, I think you can see my opinion on it immediately. All right, so Reg FD, the most important regulation for investors in the US. This is what we call the fair disclosure rule. This requires value relevant firm information to be disclosed simultaneously to all investors and the public via press releases or SEC filings. If a firm has quarterly earnings to report, it has to disclose those quarterly earnings publicly at the exact same time to everyone. If the firm's CFO is resigning, the firm must disclose that publicly to everyone at the same time. Conference calls discussing the firm's quarterly earnings, uh, called earnings calls, are open to the public, and you can get transcripts of them on the Bloomberg terminal. Now, the purpose of Reg FD is to ensure that every investor has the same information available concerning the firm. This means that no one investor should be able to profit from insider trading. The better your analysis, the better you should be at picking stocks. That's the theory behind this. And the higher your return on your portfolio should be. In other words, if everyone has the exact same information, it's the best investor, the best stock picker that wins. Now, the idea that more analysis of publicly available information will give you a more accurate valuation of the firm's stock is captured by mosaic theory. Mosaic theory is the theory that more public information that you piece together, the more informed you are going to be. If you've ever heard Warren Buffett discuss his strategy as a value investor, you'll know he subscribes to this theory. He and most investors, including myself, uh, read everything they can about a firm, its industry, and market conditions because allowing doing this allows you to more accurately assess the firm and its uh, its stocks prospects. I mean, it's hard to overstate just how important it is to read everything you can. Don't just take your information from one new source. Now let's talk about brokers or specifically stock brokers. Brokers act as intermediaries between buyers and sellers of securities that make the process of buying and selling securities easier for their clients. If you're the client of a broker, your broker will either sell you their shares when you want to buy a stock or send your order to the exchange so it can be filled by another investor or broker. Most brokers you or I use will grant you access to their alternative trading system like TD Ameritrade's Thinkorswim platform. When you purchase securities through a broker, those securities are held in street name, meaning that officially the broker's name is on them, but the broker is just holding them for you. Now, there are several types of brokerage accounts you can open. As an individual, you can open an individual account. Surprise, surprise. Until I got married, I had several individual accounts with several different brokers. Uh, once I got married, though, I opened a joint account with my wife. Uh, joint accounts allow both parties to access the funds and trade on those accounts. Now, a custodial account is an account of a minor that requires a parent or guardian to be involved in all transactions. These are great if you have a teenager that wants to learn about investing, but you don't want them to you know, put all their money in, oh, I don't know, the, the latest cryptocurrency. Now, your account can either be a cash account or a margin account. A cash account allows you to invest the capital that you contributed to your account, and that's it. A margin account is a bit more difficult to obtain since this account allows you to buy on margin through your broker or I should just say trade on margin through your broker, basically get a loan from your broker and then invest that money. Usually you can specify what kind of account you want when you initially contact a new bro broker to set up an account. For example, with most of my individual brokerage accounts, those were margin accounts because I occasionally like to engage in short trades and invest in assets like currencies and futures. Having a margin account is necessary if I were to make any of those trades. Now, there are two big categories of brokers, full service and discount brokers. 
Full service brokers will give you greater access to the markets and they're more likely to help you purchase shares of IPOs. They'll often give you advice on what to buy and sell as well. However, there's an agency cost to choosing this type of broker. Full service brokers often charge fees that are a percentage of the assets that they're trading on your behalf. This means that they have the incentive to get you to buy and sell more than you otherwise would, simply to increase their compensation. Now, this is what we call churning, and it's a well-known phenomenon in the brokerage industry. Discount brokers, on the other hand, will often charge you at most a flat fee per trade. In 2019, most of the large discount brokers stopped charging their clients any fees on stock trades. However, they still charge fees on options and trades of other uh, different types of securities. As time goes on, more of these discount brokers are offering research reports to their clients. For example, E-Trade and TD Ameritrade offered uh, research reports on most stocks with market caps above 100 million in the U.S. These brokers will typically give you access to their trading platform, uh, which is an alternative trading system, or as we sometimes call it, an electronic communications network. This platform allows you con to conduct your own analysis. Now, here's a list of brokers by type. Some of the biggest banks in the U.S. are full-service brokers, and they have been since the passage of the Financial Services Modernization Act in the 1990s. I've listed some more of the popular discount brokers in the second column here. You know, brokers like Fidelity, Robinhood, Bank of America. Uh, I, for context, I pretty much all of my accounts right now are in Fidelity. Uh, you know, just retirement accounts, joint accounts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, now, I actually recommend that as a student in my class, you do open a brokerage account with one of the discount brokers in the second column. I can't recommend that enough. It gives you the real trading experience. If you want my advice, the best discount broker to start with is actually a broker that I admittedly don't have on this, this list. It's TD Ameritrade. Uh, I, I guess technically it's on this list because they just got acquired by Schwab. Uh, but TD Ameritrade, uh, they have a brokerage platform called the Thinkorswim platform. And that platform, when you open it, it allows you to engage in what's called paper trading, meaning that you can, you'll start out with a set amount, I believe it's $100,000 of fictitious money, and you can invest that just the same way you would with an actual dollar value in your brokerage account, and you can make trades, you can see how they play out. Uh, if you're just starting out, opening up, I guess now it's just a Charles Schwab Thinkorswim account, that would be my, my best recommendation. Now let's talk about trading costs. There are two big trading costs you should know about, commissions and the bid-ask spread. The commission is the fee that you pay to your broker so that they'll process your order to buy or sell assets. It's the explicit cost of trading. Brokers are perpetually trying to undercut one another, and they've been lowering this, this commission for years. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, a lot of uh, these other brokers, they just stopped charging commissions for stock trades in 2019. However, they still charge trades or fees on trades for options and all kinds of other uh, uh, assets. Now, the bid-ask spread is the other cost of trading. And this is what we typically call an implicit cost. It's a cost that you might not see. It's not going to be as, uh, as straightforward as your brokerage commission. Now, the bid-ask spread is the difference between two numbers, the bid and the ask. Uh, so typically what we do is we subtract the uh, highest bid price from the lowest asking price, and that's going to be your bid-ask spread. All right, now that we've talked about the bid-ask spread, we need to talk about what a bid price and an asking price are. So a bid price is the price that an investor is willing to pay to buy a security. Uh, the lowest bid price is obviously going to be very, very low. The highest bid price is the thing that we're most interested in because it's uh, probably going to be the first bid that's going to be filled by some investor that wants to sell their shares. The asking price is the price that investors who own assets are willing to sell those assets for. And the most interesting asking price is going to be the lowest current asking price. 
Now the spread is just the difference between the highest bid and the lowest ask. So let's take a look at an example. So in this example, we're looking at the bids submitted by investors using limit buy orders and limit sell orders. So these are orders where you put in a, a bid price or a, an asking price. Now the number in the first column represents the open buy orders or orders where an investor has offered to buy shares for no more than a specific bid price. The second column are, is full of limit sell orders where investors specify the amount they're willing to sell their shares at no less than. So in this case, this 221.25, this investor is willing to sell 200 shares for no less than this 221.25 per share. Now the difference between these two, uh, you know, the lowest asking price and the highest bid price, this is going to be our bid ask spread. So notice here that it's 14 cents. That's our spread. Now for context, the spread will change depending on the security in question and the time period when we're considering buying or selling. Uh, you know, for some stocks like Berkshire Hathaway's Class A shares, the spread can actually be in the thousands of dollars because there's a massive difference between the lowest open asking price and the highest bid price for that particular stock. There's just not a lot of volume for those shares. Uh, if we were to look at Apple's current Oh, spread when those shares are trading, uh, that spread's probably going to be maybe a cent, maybe a few cents. It's very, very liquid. And so the spread will be very, very low. All right. Now, one final question as we talk about the bid ask spread, what happens if someone offers to pay 221.25 to buy these 200 shares that are listed right here? Well, if someone's willing to buy these 200 shares for this outstanding limit sell order, this order is going to be processed. They'll get to buy those shares for 221.25 and this order will drop out. So what we're left with is that the lowest asking price in the market will become this, what is now the second lowest asking price. So the bid ask spread will actually jump up a bit. It'll turn from 14 cents to 22 cents, which is the difference between uh, this one right here and this bid price that stays the same. Now, there are many types of orders that you can use to buy and sell securities. We've already talked about bid, uh, limit buy and limit sell orders, but uh, I think it's important to also talk about market orders. Uh, a market order is the simplest order that you can have. It simply tells your broker that you want to buy or sell a set number of shares for the best price possible. You don't put in a specified dollar value. You just say, I want to buy. 200 shares, or I want to sell 300 shares for whatever the best price you can get me is. Uh, this is, if you're a long-term investor and the market is open, this is very often the method I, that I would recommend just because you want to make sure that that order gets filled uh, as soon as possible. You don't want to put that order in and then not have it filled. This is actually the type of order that I use for pretty much all of my trades. The next orders that we have are the ones I've already mentioned, limit buy and limit sell orders. So a limit buy order is just an order to buy a security at a specified price, but no higher. And a limit sell order that creates those asking prices. That's just an order to sell a security, but only if its price is at a certain level, but no lower. We can also have stop loss orders and stop buy orders. And a stop loss order, this is a really good hedge or risk mitigation tool. It allows you to put an order in to sell assets if the price falls to a specified price. So let's say I'm worried about my Apple shares falling, oh, let's say 5%. I could put in a limit, a stop loss order to sell those shares if the price of Apple stock falls to a certain price. It essentially reduces my risk of Apple share price tanking below that price. A stop buy order, this is a great way to make sure that you don't miss out. Uh, so you put in a stop buy order that says, if the price of this asset rises to a certain level, buy these shares because I expect them to appreciate in the future. Okay, so let's take a look at a very quick example. If you wanted to sell 200 shares using market orders, how much would you receive? Well, if you're selling using market orders, what you're going to do is you're not going to focus on 
the asks because those are just outstanding. What you're going to focus on are the bids. And what you're going to do is you're going to sell your first 100 shares at the highest bid price, the highest price that you can get, which is $9. And then you still have 100 shares to sell, so you're going to sell those shares for $8 a share. So your grand total, the amount that you're going to be able to sell those 200 shares for, is $1,700. Now, let's talk about how you trade securities in the real world. Let's get beyond the bid-ask spread and stuff. Uh, the first thing that you do when you want to trade securities in the real world is go out and open a brokerage account. I've already given you my thoughts on that. Uh, first thing I would do if I were a new investor, I would go to Charles Schwab, which purchased TD Ameritrade, I believe in 2023, maybe early 2024, and open an account on the Thinkorswim platform. This is one of the best platforms. It's one of the most famous and allows you to paper trade. You don't have to invest any money once you open that brokerage account. Although that is the second step to trading. You fund your account by linking a bank account to your brokerage account. Uh, so you're going to tell your broker, I have a bank account here, and they're going to make that link. It'll usually take a couple of days. Once that link is made, you can transfer as much as you want from your bank account to your brokerage account. And then uh, that's when we start the investment process. We identify... Uh, our assets, our goals, our risk tolerance, everything that we talked about in uh, our earlier videos. I shouldn't say chapter one, I should say our, our week one material. Now the final thing I should say is do not day trade as an individual investor. I cannot specify that enough. Uh, this is something I tell every class that I have. Uh, you'll probably hear it again if you have me in a later class, which a lot of you will, uh, do not day trade as an individual investor. Uh, if you're wondering why, uh, let's talk about that. So a day trader is just any investor who buys and sells stocks throughout the day uh, hoping to make a quick profit. They buy, let's say, at 10 o'clock, and then later that day they, they're hoping to sell at 2 o'clock once the share price rises. This is, I mean, it's great if you have complete information, but we as investors do not have that, that complete information. Day trading is highly risky, uh, especially if you are buying on margin, uh, if you're shorting, anything like that. The reason it's highly risky is because you are at a significant information disadvantage. Uh, you as an individual investor, yes, you have access to public resources. You have access to maybe a Bloomberg terminal if you have an extra $20,000, $21,000 a year lying around. Uh, the downside here is that you, you're at, an, at a disadvantage because you don't have a team of analysts giving you recommendations. Uh, over a long period of time, you are going to lose because day traders, they're competing with high frequency traders that can beat you to the market with new information every single time. And ultimately your, your trading costs, those are going to add up. Uh, so remember you do have, uh, explicit fees on ass on asset trades other than equities and you have the bid ask spread to cross the bid ask spread. That's an implicit cost to trading. And that can really add up if there's not a lot of people willing to, uh, sell shares to you or buy your shares. So ultimately, you are at a significant disadvantage. Don't ever day trade. It is a horrible idea. Some people inevitably will get into day trading as college students, and they will end up losing a large amount of money. Uh, and anyone who says they day traded their way into financial success, very often they talk about their success. They don't talk about the trades where they lost a large amount of money. So that's that. Okay, so let's wrap up. Reg FD is kind of the framework for investing in the United States. It indicates that all value relevant information must be made public to everyone at the same time. We have different brokers with different services available in the US market. Those include full service brokers, discount brokers. Uh, we talked about the bid ask spread. It's a measure of market liquidity. Uh, high bid ask spread means that a market for an asset is very illiquid. A low bid ask spread means that a market for a stock like Apple is very liquid. And the bid ask spread is our implicit cost to trading. And finally, 
don't ever day trade. I can't stress that enough. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this video and I will see you on the next video. Thank you.